Hello, everybody. I'm Chris Caligari, and I'm your host for uh, for Project Kubert. And this is our weekly meeting to discuss uh, any uh, topics that uh, we would like to bring in front of the community. Um, I'm going to post the link to our meeting notes. Um, to oh no, not that. Okay, sorry about that. Um, meeting notes are posted to chat. So if you could fill in your attendance, I would appreciate that. And um, do we have any new community members this week that would like to say hi? Um, looking through our attendance here and everybody looks familiar. Okay, uh, let's move on to the agenda then. Maya has the first item with disk resize. Okay, so I have uh, shared an uh, actual email with all the information as well. Um, probably, maybe I should share it too. It's the link, the disk resize one. So we were interested in making data volumes expand, uh, clone a bit faster. Um, and just to check, you can hear me, right? Yep. Okay, cool. So we were interested in making um, cloning faster. And one of the things that's required is expanding the disk.image file in some scenarios. And we we're going to make that into a feature where you can expand the data volume offline. But I was going to present all of that uh, yesterday, uh, that's week, but I realized I don't have an explanation for why it's not online. So it's online now. Online meaning it's it works on a running VM and it's gonna uh, the implementation I'm working on is in Kubernetes code. So Kubernetes has a feature case, has background. Uh, expand persistent volume, expand new persistent volume, you can expand a PVC, uh, what's missing for the VM to take advantage of it. Um, one, if it's a this.image file, we need to increase the size of it. And if it's, and regardless, whether it's a block or a file system, we should also notify the VM about this. So um, I have, uh, an implementation where um, the sizes of the PVCs and the virtual or like uh, tr tries to see what the expected size should be, sends that to the build launcher with the virtual machine options. It compares it to the actual size and expands if it's not big enough and sends the block resize command to the VM with the lever. For a blocker size, it will. Uh, I haven't found a way to actually be notified that the resi resize is happening, so I'm tracking the size and, and the volume status. If it's changed, I pass around the change disks and send the block resize to the B VM. So I have some code that works. There. It's not full complete, there's no work in progress PR, there's no Things might change a little bit. I hope this is a good way to pass information around with the virtual machine options between the VILT and the VILT launcher. Um, some uh, pitfalls, I have only implemented the, to this.image raw files, not to QCOW2, because um, a QMU image does not like running on a, on a file that is being used by QMU. And it theoretically should be solvable. And I've only tried this with Rookset and it does online resize. And I don't know how common or uncommon offline resize like, um, expansion, but not in use. And maybe I should address that one with like a status for the a condition for the VM, VMI. But, uh, if you stop and start it again, then 
it would resize the file system, the file, does the, this dot image for you. So that's uh, my plan with some implementation. So it's probably a valid one because the code almost works. So I'm wondering if anyone has any feedback or suggestions or. Yeah, I think this is a great feature. Um, my question is, um, so generally like the, so the, okay, so my, I guess my first question is about the API. So if you want, if a user wants to resize or, or expand a disk, do they expand the uh, PVC directly or via like a data volume template or the data volume? They expand the PVC directly. Okay, so then um, the so the data volume templates and the data volumes stay unchanged, and so and then the vert handler will be watching all PVCs, and it will detect when uh, the size changes and update the virtual machine options uh, for vert launcher. That's the yes. general flow. Okay. Yeah, I think. I think that's fine. Um, I guess the one thing to note, and uh, perhaps it makes sense, it's just the, the uh, kind of division of labor between data volumes and PVCs. So it, right now we have this perhaps interesting behavior where uh, if a PVC is that's owned by a data volume is deleted, it will get, you know, repopulated. Um, so if you expand a PVC and then it gets deleted, it will get recreated with uh, the original size, which is probably fine. Um, cool, yeah, no, I think this is, this is good. And I look uh, forward to seeing uh, more details. Cool. I'll hopefully have a PR ready soon. Yeah, and I guess one thing that uh, going along with this is, um, and maybe community has input on this. So this uh, will essentially, you know, trigger this resize when a VM is started. Um, so. Imagine a flow. So we're we're really um, trying to evangelize this golden image use case where you're cloning from a, a PVC. And basically, one issue we have now is if you're cloning from a smaller PVC to a bigger PVC, um, you know the disk.img is still the same size. So there's just a lot of unused space. Um, and, uh, you know, the question is, do we want to um, also have an expansion phase during this CDI clone process? Or is it enough to just wait until the VM is started? and do it then. I mean, I, I can weigh in my opinion, which is that I think it's probably uh, more consistent to just have, have it always happen in the one place, which is that VM startup, um, rather than having multiple uh, flows where it has to be handled. I would agree with that also seeing how how uh, other um, virtual machines and cl other cloud providers um, handle that operation. Okay, that's definitely uh, makes life easier. So I have a, a couple of questions. Um, how do we know how big to make the file? Uh, if we're talking about the file system one. So we see the size of the PVC. Uh, how are we um, figuring out what that corresponds to 
for the file? Like, do we understand the overhead and everything, I guess, of the file system and all of that? So, um, this is like an unfortunate, I um, probably should have written down on the PVC which overhead it uses. I'm going to have some kind of icky compatibility code to not trample over existing things that uh, reserve some overhead. But um, I tend to have an annotation on the PVC if it's reserving some of the space for overhead then are do the calculation in vert handler based on some annotation, which contains uh, like how much to reserve. Okay. And for the guests to actually make use of this new space, I guess internally they would have to do some sort of expansion of their like logical volume or something like that. For example, it was a Linux host. Um, is that just kind of being assumed that that's going to, I guess I'm trying to say that we aren't doing any sort of integration on internally within the host, uh, the guest, excuse me to try to uh, get the guests to take advantage of this new space. We're just making this space available and the guests could use it, whatever that would mean, I guess. Yes. Okay. So it is, uh, it is uh, worthwhile to note, it's a good question, but um, I see that Alice is on the call um, and she's working on some live guest FS integrations for Kubert and um, it will be possible in the future to actually have a pipeline where you would increase the size of the PVC and then schedule a um, uh, some kind of a, a job to do that. But the problem is with it being a live, uh, if the VM is running, you of course can't have libguestfs going in there and, and making changes. So it is a good thing that we should think about because it would be nice to be able to actually create some sort of a pipeline or job that could um, could do that because libguestfs does know how to um, uh, to enter a guest and expand file systems. Oh, interesting. So for offline uh, resize, is libguestfs always the thing that's being used? Well, we don't have, I mean, you could use that. We don't have any kind of uh, integrations for it. But yeah, I mean, like if, without automatic processes, you could, I guess, expand your PVC and then you could attach, you know, manually construct a pod that has libguestfs in it and, uh, and, and have it uh, do some things. I believe that would be possible. Yeah, okay. I mean, uh, you can just use vr 3 size uh, to, to do that. Um, use don't have a task in Tectum pipeline that do the resize, but that's of course possible to add. Yeah, so it would be interesting to figure out if there's an, in, a way to integrate here, because I could see a bit of a conflict where if you're doing a, a live resize operation, it can't have uh, coordination with the operating system. Uh, but if you were doing some sort of offline uh, operation, you could. But I think so, Maya. I guess I would wonder. Yeah, if the VM is not running and the V, it, I guess the uh, Kubert will still be monitoring the PVCs and triggering the resize operations. Uh, and then, like we discussed earlier, they would um, they would the disk image file and these things would be um, updated at the time the VM is starting. Yeah, the inconsistency was the thing I was trying to hint at. Uh, if we can just figure out a way to uh, somehow model this in a way that makes sense. And just to clarify, if we use the this libguestfs <laughs> appliance on a live VM, that's just going to cause chaos, right? Uh, trying yeah. to okay. Just, we need. We're actually working on some kind of uh, locking mechanisms, and I guess you guys could stay tuned for some more info from Alice about that issue as well. Um, she's looking at it. Um, we're trying to find a way to basically uh, have some sort of system to to indicate that uh, a certain set of PVCs are in use by you know either either a Tecton pipeline or by Kubert itself, but not both. 
Interesting. Yeah, this is pretty cool. I am, uh, I guess, conflicted about uh, directly working on the PVC rather than working on the data volume, uh, just because of the um, the source of creation would be the data volume. So that's the thing the user has created. So I would kind of expect that to be the interface they go through, uh, but I'm not necessarily, I don't know. I guess it's the best thing. I'd have to, I'd want to see a little bit more before we completely commit to somebody mutating, uh, letting a user mutate a PVC that's owned by a data volume. So um, Maya, I don't know if you want to, um, to color in a little bit about, because th this was actually discussed uh, in the early design. Um, uh, maybe maybe you can uh, shine some light there. I think the idea, the over the overarching idea, is that data volumes are seen as, as a as a provisioning step, and that's the important object during provisioning. And then uh, PVCs become the important object during consumption. And this is one of the reasons why uh, code was added so that in the volume type you don't need to specify data volume anymore if it, the PVC was actually provisioned by one because we're trying to make it less important to uh, users of a VM that's already been provisioned um, for them to have to worry about the data volume object. Like maybe even someday uh, that object could be detached uh, from the PVC once it's been ready, uh, made ready, and then you just use it like a regular PVC. And sorry, I just basically asked you to contribute, Maya, and then like talked anyway. <laughs> I, I get it, I think. Yeah. So um, from a community perspective, the only thing I'd ask is to uh, follow the, the design standard that uh, we recently built and uh, get this into the design folder. Yeah, it'll definitely be helpful from an API standpoint. Uh, Let's uh, get this documented, and then uh, every like we uh, we have the the recording of everybody's comments, but it would be really good to have them um, uh, tracked via PR. I'm going to reply to this. Oops. I'll do it after the after the meeting. Because I'm the wrong user. Okay. Thank you very much, Maya. That was a great discussion. Our agenda is thin today. How about it? Does um, anybody else have anything to talk about? Can you hear me? Oh, yes, I hear you. Okay, sorry, I had some microphone issues. Um, I wanted to say that while this is propagated through the PVC, there is no, um, it doesn't limit the ability to start this by changing the data volume, it's just that if this were to happen, it would happen in CDI in an independent PR. You will change the data volume, that will change the PVC and begin this change. Okay, makes sense. One of the things that's in the back of my head that uh, I guess I haven't even said yet is I'm, I'm concerned about BERT handler uh, watching all PVCs because that could be potentially a, a lot of resources and then it's like um, every node would be watching a lot of resources as well. So it's compounded. Uh, so I was trying to think of ways to reduce that. And one of the things I was thinking about was like, well, well we just watch PVC or uh, data volumes instead, but that won't work because it's totally possible to just use a PVC without a data volume. And that's where my train of thought was going. So that's a separate train of thought, but uh, somehow when we're doing this design, I'd like for us to think of a way of um, isolating or figuring out some way to narrow how many 
objects we're watching on Burt Handler. So maybe add a label to a uh, resize PVC that actually needs to be worked on by Burt Handler. So we don't have to watch all of them, but we get alerted when there's one that, that needs to be resized on the exact node that needs to be resized, something like that. I know that might sound like an early optimization, but we can quickly get into uh, some, some trouble if we, uh, like for example, have a 100 node cluster that's watching all PVCs. So every node is watching all PVCs and there's thousands and thousands of PVCs. That can get kind of messy. So something else um, to think about. So fortunately, I am not adding any PVC watching that doesn't already exist. There is already something watching all PVCs. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, that could be a problem. That might actually, um, that might go away. Let me, all right, we'll, we'll take, we'll, yeah, catch up on this offline. Uh, yeah, so just the background quickly, we're doing some scale and performance testing and profiling. And that's probably, if we're doing anything inefficient there, it's probably going to get caught and addressed uh, fairly soon. So I don't know if we can depend on that. We'll, we'll see what's actually happening behind the scenes there. We could just label uh, all the relevant PVCs with an annotation that this is the VM that is relevant for it or something. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it would have to be a label with the node name or something, and then right. the handler would only watch those. Anyway, just throwing that out there, since performance is something that's been on my mind quite a bit lately. But I, I don't think that, that that's definitely not a blocker for, for this design or anything like that. It's just something to um, consider. Yeah, definitely all the more reason to uh, to get this into the, the proper design um, directory. So we have a, a written a written history of, of these topics. Okay, any more thoughts on disk expansion? Um, uh, the thing that looks at all PVCs, it's looking at all the PVCs in a namespace, so it might not be bad at scale. Okay, any more thoughts on disk resize? David, Adam, Kevin? Uh, I don't have anything. Just look forward to having more discussion, uh, I guess, out of band of this meeting. So more design discussion.
it looks really good um, or it looks like a really cool feature. I'm also interested in, I wouldn't want to discourage just working on a POC to prove out the technology immediately as well. It's definitely important. Disk resizes, just meat and potatoes of sysadmining. Got to have uh, some kind of feature in there. Uh, just something to, to hit that hit my mind, and then let's uh, move on if no one else has anything. But we should consider the implications of snapshots when it comes to resizing. So if you have the size of a PVC changing uh, between snapshots, it's going to be a corner case that we addressed in Rev as well, so or an overt. So uh, just keep that in mind in the design. Sounds good. Got that noted, Aaron. Okay. Still, still uh, an, an open agenda and floor. Does anybody else have anything before I talk about event events? Going once, twice. Okay, well, I have good news, everybody. We uh, just got a uh, notice from All Things Open 2021 that our paper has been accepted. So uh, Stu and I will be going in person, um, given that nothing drastic happens with, uh, with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we'll be going to Raleigh and, uh, and doing our, our presentation of uh, an, an internet distributed um, Kubernetes cluster with Kubvert on Raspberry Pis. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I've just thought of something, Stu. Um, all of our uh, systems will be at our house while we're in Raleigh. <laughs> so, that's, that's correct. <laughs> oh, I thought you'd bring one. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be interesting yeah, I mean, I, i'll be around to maintain gonna... mine over here so <laughs> <laughs> it's only a live demo we'll be calling up our wives and uh or our, our kids to say quick re reboot that raspberry pi <laughs> just pull the power plug and plug it back in <laughs> it's like a manual fencing device you call call somebody at the house to... <laughs> So uh, I, I suggest that we uh, create a working meeting so um, we stay on track with uh, getting our demo built. What do you guys think of like a Thursday morning or Friday morning meeting? Friday works it's, best for me. Yeah. Friday, okay. It's Whatever, no, no, no. no. The, I will probably not be able to attend this week. Okay. Kevin, are you yeah. US or are you Germany? Germany, but I I kind of live in your time zone, so don't worry. Okay. Uh, he <laughs> he lives uh, in a different time zone than most of us on the US. Just <laughs> making sure you guys are all synced up here. It's several yeah. hours difference. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I. I I mean, I'm the outlier here with Pacific time zone, so I don't mind getting up in the wee hours of the morning. It's... No, I get it. Don't worry. I'm 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 mostly around for uh, Eastern time afternoons. So okay, uh... yeah, that works out even better for me then. We can we can uh, yeah we can figure it out offline I think uh, on, on Slack. Yeah, okay. Also, if it doesn't work for Stu this week, we'll we can see it when it works. Looking forward to it. The Raspberry is looking at me, wanting to be used every day. I know. <laughs> I built this beautiful rack out in my garage. Took a serious network outage on my 
on my home network and it impacted my kids uh, uh, remote learning, remote school and got everything working. <laughs> now it's just sitting. Okay, uh, pull requests that need attention. Um, do we have anything that has been lingering? No. Um, let's take a look at mailing list, make sure that everything has been addressed. Lots of activity on BERT launchers. We just talked about Maya's disk resize feature. Get my specs for NVIDIA. It's got a good conversation. Daniel, do you want to talk about SIG storage tests at all? No, I think we're we're good there. Uh, we have a PR on the way, and um, we had a couple of discussions on the PR itself, so it's fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, how to keep TCP socket connections alive after live migration? This is a topic that came up on Slack. Also, is anybody available to to uh, comment on this? Okay, I'll uh, I'll just ask him to create an issue, please. I'm gonna have a look at that because I I think Peter asked if SSH connections I'm building right now can live migrate, and I don't think they can. I don't know. I don't know how it would work. That was it. Thoughts on a uh, native VNC client? on Mac. So what it, that's whoops. What's being asked? I'm not sure I so uh, this was uh my email that I threw out here, there was an issue on uh, that 4207 where someone had um, put in an issue saying, hey, could we use the default uh, VNC client that's built into um, Mac? Um, so I did a little bit of research on it. And the, the answer basically comes down to um, no, you can't use it. Um, because the default client that's built into the OSX um, absolutely requires a password. Um, and you can't seem to bypass it. Um, at least nothing that I could find allowed you to bypass it. Um, and this has been seen by some other projects um, where they had the same sort of issue. So I, mean, quite frankly, I think probably um, the thing could probably just be closed out as can't do it. Um, but I don't know. I just I, I threw the the um, threw it out there to the mailing list because I didn't really see anything on the, the issue when I had gone through and done any research on it. That's interesting. Well, where's the password coming? Can we set a password on our VNC? It seems like we should be able to. And would that resolve the issue? 
so that was the other thing. I don't, uh, I mean, quite honestly, I don't know enough of the, the code or wasn't able to, you know, really dig into it far enough to see if we could set some kind of password or, you know, pretend proxy a password or something like that so that it might actually work. Um, but I also wasn't quite sure, you know, I'm more than willing to kind of maybe dig into it a little bit more and see, but I would need a little bit of guidance and where to kind of look at or what, um, you know, what generates the, the actual VNC server, um, how we do that and whether or not we could put a password into it. Yeah, it's all handled <laughs> with Levert. So uh, yeah. I would just look into how to set a password using the domain XML and Levert for VNC. And then we would um, just put in a secret or something and attach it to the VMI if that was desired. Well, I think I've seen it in the in the Libvirt UI. It can Libvirt manages UI, so it's. I think it's possible to set a password. So I guess the other question would be, is that something that we want to do like across the board? Is have some type of because I, this would only, based on my research on it, that this would only be fixing a problem for, um, you know, OSX, um, and using the default client, um, because the default client absolutely requires a password. So if you, you know, it would be one of those things where if you're in that very situation, then we start assigning passwords to all your VMs and then you could use it. It seems kind of like a rough, um, rough situation. It almost seems like it's better just to use a third party client that um, doesn't require a password, unless we think there's a real need to start locking down or, you know, applying a password to all the VNC connections. We wouldn't have to apply to all of it. It would be an opt-in sort of thing where somebody would have the option to protecting their VNC console with a password if they wanted for whatever reason. So I'm on Mac and I didn't realize that uh, OSX came with a VNC client. I've had a lot of trouble with uh, getting console connections to VMs and have had to use a couple of different um, clients. So I yeah, think I, I spoke about that in a couple of blog posts ago. Um, I, I guess using a third party client, I haven't personally had any problems. Um, it just sort of seems to work. Um, yeah, yeah. I, and I think, you know, adding, adding a password to the VNC server, I think would be a separate, um, it's a more of a separate issue or a separate request. Mm -hmm. Um, than what this is here, because this is, you know, very specific to using that built-in VNC client um, on Mac. Um, you know, it, definitely I could see um, a new feature request or a new issue saying, hey, I would like to be able to put passwords on, on my VMs, um, or I'm sorry, put passwords on my, you know, VNC server for my VM. Um, but I think that's a separate issue than this one right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as soon as you and as soon as you start talking about putting a password on that VNC server, then that balloons up to like integration with LDAP or Active Directory or something. Uh, I also noticed that this uh, this issue is from September eighteenth, twenty twenty. So um, it's been sitting around for quite a while. We got one thumb up and a couple folks commenting on it. I don't know, looks, looks pretty right for closing to me. And it's Jason Dytiberius. If, uh, any of you got anybody knows them? I do. <laughs> Nobody knows Jason. No, the only thing I recognize is the red beard in the picture. Yeah, um, probably Twitter <laughs> or some other place, but I don't actually know the guy. He he's definitely a red beard. <laughs> <laughs> he's a turncoat. <laughs> Stick our nose up at him. <laughs> No, he's a he's a, a good guy. He was on the OpenShift install team for a long time. 
I met some actually. So sad, I don't sad that know you moved if on. maybe somebody already mentioned this, but I was just looking through the uh, QMU KVM uh, man page and the VNC uh, option on there does have a password option. So it's possible. Yeah, I think, like I say, I think more, um, you know, there, there might be a different issue or a different feature request here to actually be able to put passwords on um, VMs or VMIs that are created um, for, you know, more secure access. Although I'm wondering how that would work with the, um, the, the OpenShift UI. But um, I, I think that's a separate request from what this is, which is really just, um, you know, can we support that built-in client in the, the Mac? And I think that the answer, at least by default, is no. Um, but that's just my thought. Like I say, it's more, it, this is almost, um, I think, like a, um, you know, issue scrubbing or something like that, just closing something out if, if we really don't, you know, if it's not doable now um, without, you know, potentially affecting every other user's um, interaction with it. I think that's fair. I, I would add, uh, as you close the issue, also give a hint that maybe this is the issue you ought to open, uh, asking for a password feature. Yeah, I can certainly, um, I'll, per I'll go in and, you know, just add a little bit more about that. Um, and, um, you know, mention that it, it might be possible to handle it through that way. Um, and then, but I don't think I have any, you know, ability to actually close it out. It was more just a helpful hint that you might be able to close out an issue um, at this point once, uh, you know, everybody agreed on it. So I, I think I can uh, post a comment in here. We all we all want to just work on a, a comment here in the notes. I'll copy and I'll copy it in. I may be able to be a maintainer here. Or David can. He's always a he always likes to do bug triage. Do you guys want to type something in there? Yeah, you, you're looking for me to just type something in around. Um... Yeah, I could put, put a comment in there about uh, uh, maybe creating an issue about um, the VNC server and having an option to enable password. Yep. Or even set different authentication mechanisms. Yeah, I didn't. Catch, there was somebody who actually um, was just looking at the um, GMU stuff. Um, I don't know if you've got a link that you could put in there for um, in that doc for you know what that feature is or what that that call out was just as a reference that might be helpful or I can look it up and find it. Okay, I can have that. It wasn't me who mentioned the QMU man page. Oh, Chandler.
there anything else to add to this? The only other thing, you know, I was just going to, I didn't want to, I've been editing these things before where text is changing around at the beginning. So I was going to put something in there about uh, that the, the default client in Mac OS S only supports passworded um, VNC uh, servers. Um, so it's not something that can be supported right now, but, and then leave the rest of it in there. And I, cause I think that fully addresses the, the issue. Okay, yeah. I've, I've stopped typing, go ahead. Yeah, no, I've, uh, yep. if Mark, we can, uh, how about you comment on that issue um, offline here so we can move on? Yeah, 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 by all means. Sure, thank you. And uh, by moving on, I mean it's uh, 7.50 a.m. and uh, we've about run out of time, so. I suggest we skip bug scrub this week, which we did that last week also. So next week, um, we should focus on a good bug scrub uh, rather than get down in the, uh, get deep into any agenda topics. Does everybody agree with that? I hear so much clapping and cheering from the audience. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Daniel is cheering and clapping. So <laughs> we have it. Um, I'll return nine minutes to you. Um, thank you for joining us this week and um, have a good week. We'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good week. Bye. 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 Thank you.